Welcome to another episode of Rich Politics. This is a Sunday special. But before I introduce our guest today, please don't forget, hit that subscribe button. That's right, so you can get these weekly, non-politically correct broadcasts from this Welshman having a rant about all things <laughs> politics. Well, what a week it's been. COVID has been dominating the news, as you'd expect. Here in Wales, we've had a leaked document suggesting that there will be a national lockdown, but the First Minister, Mark Drakeford, hasn't said nothing, and they're all hiding from scrutiny down at the Welsh Parliament. Has Brexit been sidelined? The mainstream media seem to be very careful to be talking about Brexit. Well, my guest today is not afraid to talk about Brexit. He is the former MEP for London and chairman of Unlock and Brexit Watch, and he joins me now. Ben Habib, welcome to Rich Politics. Thank you very much, Richard. Good to see you. <laughs> and, and how are you doing? <laughs> First question. Well, kind of, you know, like everyone else, slightly holding my head in my hands, looking at what's going on with the country with COVID and, and indeed with Brexit and just wondering how the hell we got into this mess. I read in the Express today, actually, I know that uh, John Redwood, who's a champion of Brexit as well himself, is a Brexiteer, was interviewed by Martin Dubney and Belinda De Lucy on Unlocked, which is um, uh, the, uh, an organisation that you are very involved in as the chairman. And uh, the expression I think he used about Michel Barnier on these negotiations, he, he, I think he said something like, you need just to stay in Brussels. Is that right? Yeah. Well, I think he should stay in Brussels. And actually, if we were really serious about no deal now being a genuine option, we would cease to negotiate with them. We would not receive him in London. We would say, Mr. Barnier, stay in Brussels. When you're prepared to offer us a genuine free trade agreement along the lines of Canada, give us a call. But we don't want to talk with you until then. That's how you send a clear message. But, you know, he is coming to London next week. He is going to be received by David Frost and they are going to negotiate. So it's mixed messages. And the EU aren't stupid. They'll read into that weakness, of, you know, in the government. Yeah, come into that. You've got first-hand experience, of course, being a former MEP. You know what these guys are like in Brussels when it comes to negotiations. And lots of us, including people like myself, I got involved in politics because of Brexit, because of the fact that our yeah. democracy was under attack and threat, I thought, personally. But tell us a little bit about your journey into the political arena, Ben, and your time as an MEP. Well, my journey is not dissimilar to yours, I think, Richard. You know, I was kind of politically aware, but politically inactive. And I looked into the bubble of politics and I thought, well, they look reasonably intelligent, bright people. I'm sure they have the national interest at heart. And, you know, by and large, they're getting on with doing what they do. And I'm a businessman and I'll get on with what I'm doing. But then, you know, the run up to the 2016 referendum, I started hearing things which were just utterly economically illiterate, being espoused by people that should know better. So Mark Carney, for example, I think you replayed one of my clips recently. Yeah. You know, Mark Carney saying there could be a run on the banks and having to put 250 billion aside. George Osborne, who I think must be one of the worst chancellors, if not the worst chancellor we've ever had, um, talking about the need for austerity in the event that we have an economic collapse. I mean, first of all, there was no prospect of an economic collapse. Second of all, to respond to it with austerity is about as daft as a brush. So I was listening to these voices thinking, Okay. Well, this, this, this was all this scaremongering stuff, wasn't it? They were putting out Absolutely. Lots of and it was that, Project yeah. Fear. Yeah. yeah. And it was a collective, it was a, they were undermining democracy in this country in order to sway the electorate in their favor for that referendum. And I thought, right, I've got to stand up. And I wrote some furious letters to the FT and the Telegraph, some of which were printed. And that was really my first story. Then I backed off and then I heard that. Street, you know, the speech that Theresa May gave on the steps of Downing Street about the burning injustices. And I thought, great, she gets it. It's not <laughs> just about Brexit. You know, it's about leveling up the country, an expression Boris now uses. It's about putting right all those injustices that being a member of the EU is allowed to just continue. Um, and then she did absolutely nothing. And then she did a Lancaster House speech, which I thought was another excellent speech. And she said, no deal is better than a bad deal. Nothing is agreed until everything's agreed and I thought right she gets it and then she did nothing and now as we all know she repeated 108 times no deal is better than a bad deal and she repeated nearly as often you know that we would be out on the 29th of March no matter what 29th of March 2019 and eventually I just got fed up with hearing all this nonsense and no action taking place I was a Tory donor then so I had the benefit of listening to some of the um, cabinet ministers, you know, in private meetings. Yeah. And one of the first cabinet ministers I, I met was Michael Gove. And it's pertinent, I think, to just mention this. And I asked him at the end of lunch, 
what no deal planning we were doing. This was June 2018, when it was evident that the EU was being rough with us. And he said, we're not doing any no deal planning. We're going to get a deal. And I thought, well, there you go. Anyone who isn't preparing for, the, by all means, travel in hope. But you have to prepare for the alternative. You have to have a plan B. And actually, I'm in, I, I've become increasingly of the view that the best deal was no deal. We yes, should well, never have well, gone you've been, for a you've, deal in the honest, first you've, place. You've been a champion of that. I like to call you Ben Abib No Deal because you have <laughs> been, you've, you've championed it and you've, of, you've often put pressure on the government from all sort, kind of sources and sort of media, not just social media, mainstream media as well. You're a popular figure, I know, in a lot of different outlets. And I know you've been pushing for that. And Ben, you know, as the country has seen the back and forth trade negotiations with the EU, uh, has led Boris uh, advising now the UK to prepare for a no deal Brexit. Should this be now goal at the start, at the outset? And how do you see the relationship with the EU on a Canada or Australian style trade agreement? Well, just before I answer that, Richard, I just want to say there's no way we're going to get a good deal from the EU. And they've been very clear about this from the start. For them, it's not an economic issue. For them, it's an ideological issue. They cannot sustain a, a successful United Kingdom. They can't do anything that might lead to a successful UK. There has to be a price to pay for Brexit. They've said that from the start. They've run us ragged. So we won't get the good deal that we hope to get. Moreover, we haven't prepared for no, we still haven't prepared for no deal. I'm not talking about, you know, making sure trucks can get in and out of Kent. I'm talking about the bright, positive vision that the government should have had for a post-Brexit Britain, a vision in which we would have taken back control of the 18 billion subsidized our farmers through a transitionary period to get them back on their feet, use some of that money to get our fisheries back on their feet, which by the way, would be hugely, there are 186 coastal communities that suffer because of the common fisheries policy. There's not a, not a peep out of government about what it would do to get them back on their feet. There's not a peep out of government on the regulations it would eject. The huge regulation bur regulatory burden that comes from, uh, from Brussels, not a peep. We are not ready for no deal. Mm. The government's single biggest failing, and it doesn't apply just to Boris, it applies, it doesn't apply just to May, it applies to Boris, is that we haven't prepared for no deal. So we're not going to get a good deal because we failed to prepare for no but, deal. You know, I'm sorry to people, bang on about it, no, but no, it's that, really that, important. It is important. Yeah. It is important. <laughs> I, think, I think the problem lots of us have is Boris was saying the right stuff. You know, he talked about post-Brexit, what Britain would look. And, you know, now we've, we've got this 80 majority, the, the Brexit party played a part in helping him. Of course, the Brexiteers, you know, the language seemed to be right from Boris. But what we're seeing on paper is very different from what Boris was saying at the start of all this. Absolutely. Well, the nicest way I can put it, and I did say it during the general election, um, and I was disappointed that media didn't pick up on it properly. But the nicest way of putting it is that he grossly misrepresented what the withdrawal agreement was. He told us that it was an oven ready, fantastic deal. And now, as we all know, he's having to try to break international law to put right some of the things that are really bad in the withdrawal agreement. The most notable of which, of course, is the Northern Irish Protocol yes. that partitions the United Kingdom. There isn't, a, there isn't an example in history, Richard, of a country that voluntarily partitions itself outside a peace process that follows a war it's lost. We are about to partition the UK without having lost a war. <laughs> it, it absolutely beggars belief. Do, do you think, though, Ben, as the UK is facing economic uncertainty, especially with COVID and stuff like that currently now, with these negotiations going on, how do you feel, though, that the UK can take a leading role as a global force, you know, it, it, because it doesn't look pretty good at the minute, does it? No, it doesn't. Um, I had had huge hopes that with an 80 seat majority, Boris would be able to really get stuff done. And this government seems, uh, you know, I'm reluctant to say it because, uh, you know, it's being recorded. This is going live. But I have to be frank. This government is inept. The handling of the covid crisis has been abysmal. No matter which strategy they took, they managed to get it wrong. And they've U-turned all over the place. They've done the same with Brexit. And so you question whether once they've got, once we've exited this transitionary period with the EU, whether this government's actually got the wherewithal to govern us at all. Um, 
you know, it, it's very sad. I don't think the UK under this government could take a leading role in anything. Yeah, well, I, I noted some tweets that uh, the guys at Unlock put out, and you retweeted, actually, Ben. I just referred to them. You're Darren Grimes talking about Boris. It's great to see Boris testing positive for a backbone <laughs> over the <laughs> negotiations. I think it was you that said, quote, uh, Barnier should stay in flipping Brussels. <laughs> he should stay in flipping uh, Brussels. That's uh, the June, language and, that yeah. Boris should give him. Yeah. And June Mummery, of course, the champion of our fisheries, as, as we all know very well. I'm glad Boris has grown a pair. So I was thrilled yeah. to see some of those. And that interview was great. And I recommend our viewers to go and watch that on Unlock. Fantastic, guys, what they're doing there on that particular channel. Ben, of course, in Wales, things are slightly different here because we do have a devolved administration, uh, which is Welsh Labour-led. And of course, the internal market bill was a big thing for us recently because they talked about it being you know the uk government grabbing powers but in fact in, in effect it wasn't they were gaining more powers but i don't want to talk about that but i want to talk about something that's pertinent to some of my listeners here in wales if i can then the snp of course yeah. continually pushing for independence and both here in wales plaid cymru and welsh labor are trying in my opinion to sleepwalk wales towards independence how could we preserve the union do you see that there is a future for our union with these devolved administrations and governments wanting more powers, more money, and are they trying to break up this institution of our union that's been around for so, so long? Yeah, well, uh, you know, if you're a unionist like I am, I see the devolved authorities as nothing but a set stepping stone towards the breakup of the United Kingdom, uh, you know, brought on by Tony Blair, something, you know, if, if any government needs any kind of policy guidance, they should just reverse everything that Tony Blair ever did. Including I, on that, we can agree. <laughs> <laughs> including devolving the various countries, and um, so I, you know, I'm, I, I, I think, and this, you, you might interpret this as me just, you know, promoting my own narrative, but I genuinely think that the best way to preserve the union is to have a no deal Brexit with the EU, and the reason I say that is because every country within the United Kingdom the four parts of the United Kingdom, all trade best with each other. Their biggest trading partner is not the EU. Our biggest trading partners are each other. Yeah. You know, our internal economy is by far bigger than anything we do externally. And to hold the family together, we would have been much better off leaving as one and not being stuck with the, you know, holding on to the apron strings of the European Union. But what Boris is doing is very dangerous because this Northern Irish protocol, without wishing to get too much into detail, the Northern Irish protocol effectively puts this border down the Northern Irish Sea, leaves Northern Ireland in the European Union Customs Union, subject to whole swathes of European Union law, subject to the supreme hegemony of the European Court of Justice in many respects. And it's setting up a model for Scotland and for the SNP to follow. And he'd be much better off to leave without a deal, get complete control of the economy, get complete control of our fisheries. And then Nicola Sturgeon would have the uphill task of having to explain to Scottish fishermen why having got back the fisheries, she now wanted to hand them over to the European Union yeah. again. And I, I think her task for Scottish, her aim for Scottish independence would be hugely diluted. Her ability to deliver it would be hugely diluted if we left without a deal so that the union of the United Kingdom stood together. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's a very good observation, Ben, because here in our Welsh context, we, we've seen this um, idea of Welsh independence is becoming more and more of a thing. And of course, the SNP are leading the way in that. And what worries a lot of people here in Wales is we couldn't sustain independence. We would be bankrupt. It would be suicidal uh, for us in Wales to actually yeah. be independent. We have a £14 billion deficit to start with. Um, the fact that we rely on the UK Treasury, of course, but you know that comes from Westminster. But for us here in Wales, the idea of independence would mean questions would have to be answered, like borders, currency, um, our defence, absolutely, the deficit. Absolutely. And what I find with Plaid Cymru in particular, these Welsh nationalists, they cannot answer definitively those questions. You know, they skirt around the answers and they come up with, well, we could sell more water. I mean, it's just ridiculous. It's not oil, <laughs> it's water. And, you know, yeah. but yet we're seeing it more and more. And of course, we have the Senate elections coming up in May next year. Well, they're supposed to be happening. 
uh, we've we, it, it's been hinted there's a possibility they might be delayed because of COVID. So we don't really know, but we're told they're happening in May next year. And there's been a lot of changes happened recently. This week in the news, the Brexit party have seen a, a divide that they've split and three of their members have gone and set up their own party. And Mark Reckless has, will be announcing on Monday what his intentions are. It's reported that he's joining Abolish the Welsh Assembly Party. So the Brexit party in Wales really has, has, has done its job, in my opinion. Brexit is getting done. Even though you and I don't agree with the kind of Brexit that's getting done, we'd prefer a no <laughs> deal, so would I. Taking back full control. Um, but how do you think um, that the Senate elections are going to play out? I know you don't know much about Welsh politics, but certainly here in Wales, do you think that what is happening with what Boris is doing is going to play into the Welsh Conservatives' hands here in Wales during the elections in May next year? Well, I think Wales is... Again, I'm hesitant to say this, but I think Wales is so firmly part of the Union of the United Kingdom. Scotland is obviously belligerent and desirous. There's very strong minority in Scotland that wants to go independent. Um, I think of Wales slightly differently. I mean, I think that it's a it's a very small minority, correct me if I'm wrong, that, you know, w wish to take Wales out. And, you know, I see where the, the union uh, of the United Kingdom, as far as Wales is concerned, is very strong. Um, but I do think the devolved authority in Wales has totally failed to function. It hasn't done anything for the Welsh people, it's failed in every endeavor it set out to, to prevail in. And, you know, it's been labor led effectively since it was set up and they've been inept. Um, I think the right way to do this is to have proper representation in Westminster and for every devolved authority to be abolished. Mm -hmm. That's very well, Ben, thanks for sharing some of that local stuff for our Welsh uh, viewers. <laughs> ben, just a few more questions because our time is nearly up, unfortunately, and I, I really enjoyed talking to you. How do you think, public trust is in, in politics and in politicians. How can it be restored, given what we've been through with the, the lies over the Brexit stuff, you know, that, that we were let down miserably, you know, that, that we've had scandal after scandal going back, the expenses and all that before that. Now the handling of COVID. You know, members of the public, which are, I certainly am and you are as well, you know, we've lost trust in politicians. How can, how can that trust be, if ever, restored? I think there's got to be political reform. Um, it's not top of anyone's agenda. You know, we all want simply the schools to work, the buses to work, the trains to work, life to go on, roof over our head for security and all the rest of it. But we, we desperately need political reform in this, in this country. We have a system which is first past the post. It allows strong government, at which at one level is good, but it, it, it enables them to turn their back on their manifesto pledges and do... I mean, if you look at what Boris promised on Brexit and what he's actually delivered, there's just no... It's a massive misrepresentation. There's got to be a mechanism put in place by which governing parties are held to account. And that's either going to be done through reforming the process by which they are elected or by reforming how they are held to account once they've been elected. I mean, maybe there should be some kind of link between their remuneration and manifesto pledges. Mm. <laughs> you know? And... You know, you take Trump, for example. Yeah, I don't, there should don't, be a connection be... between their remuneration and their pledges. If they don't absolutely, the goods, they shouldn't get paid. <laughs> if, if they make promises they don't uh, keep, well, why should they get paid? You know, yeah. They were elected to do a job. They're not doing the job. And to give Trump his due, whether you're behind him or not, he's actually followed through pretty much with everything he promised he would do. And, um, you know, that's what you want. You want, go you want government that makes promises that it keeps, that tells the truth rather than, you know, tells perpetual flipping fibs, and that's open about its own failures, is prepared to be straight with the nation and carry the nation with it. You know, one of my biggest criticisms of this government and the way, you know, democracy is now practiced in the United Kingdom is that it follows the polls. It's not leading the polls. It's not creating a vision of the United Kingdom and then convincing everyone this is the way to go. What they're doing is perpetually monitoring what the polls are saying and then framing policy around it. That is no way to govern. It's a good well, way to win well, an election. Well, well, no way to govern. Well, well, it certainly is because my, my understanding of some of the polls that are out there, they seem to be polling the same people all the time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's self-reinforcing. So you're not, you're, you're, not, you're not actually getting a general view of what the public actually want. I mean, you know, social media we know isn't the real world. We know that Twitter and Facebook and all this stuff that we, we use effectively. And it does cut through sometimes politically. But 
I think sometimes politicians are so locked into the world of social media that they can garner a sense of what's happening politically, you know, the populist idea through social media. But that's not the reality always in people's everyday lives, Ben, in our communities, is it? Oh, I completely agree. I mean, at the moment, you know, in Westminster, there's a big um, guffuffle and debate over um, critical race theory. Now, I mean, who gives a toss what cr critical race theory is in, the, in Hartlepool or in the north of England or Wales? Who cares? You I know, know, what people want is get on, deliver the public services that you promised you're going to deliver. Give us, you know, back our sovereignty. Get our fishing industry, 186 communities, as I mentioned, you know, constituencies that rely on fishing. There's so much the government could be doing and they're having a debate over critical race theory. I mean, yeah, it's I like, I think I, read, I think I read today, Ben, I think they've spent another 400 million, I think it is, on un unconscious bias training uh, for civil servants and for MPs. I mean, it's, like, oh, I mean, it's just crazy. I mean, it's, the, these things are not relevant to people's everyday lives. You know, things that matter, like jobs, investment. You know, can I, can I feed my kids? You know, here in Wales, the deprivation is so bad. You know, people don't yeah. care about unconscious bias training. I was accused of being a racist a couple of days ago because I didn't agree with it. And someone said, you're a racist yeah. and you don't know you are. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, this, this sort of absurd philosophical ideological debate evidences to me that our politicians have got far too much bloody time on their hands. They should be running the country, not getting stuck in this kind of nonsense. Look, I'm half Pakistani, half English. I could, there's no racism in this country. There's nothing. No. Everyone wants to get on. We just want to go forward. We want to be left alone to run our businesses. We want small government, less re regulation. We're desperate for less regulation. So we can just get on and prosper. We're a fantastic nation. You know, we don't need government support to get on and prosper. We need the government to get the hell out of our business. That's what we need them to do. Well, Ben, listen, our time is almost up. Man, I've, I've really, I could sit and listen to you all day, right? I, I really, really could. But Ben, just a final question before we go. Yeah. Um, what, what's next for Ben Habib then? Well, I want to make a big success of Unlocked. Um, as you've identified, I think, Richard, the only way that you're going to affect political change in this country is if the media gives different political voices a proper platform so you can get those messages out there. At the moment, mainstream media doesn't really do that for anything other than what they regard as, you know, socially acceptable, which is increasingly this kind of woke, illiberal, dictatorial liberalism. You know, I'm, I'm in danger of getting caught in the Westminster bubble using phrases <laughs> like that. But, um, you know, we need a good, honest, as you said, non-politically correct media platform, which I hope unlocked in initiatives like yours and GB News, which is also launching. I hope all these things succeed. And I hope that we can get new political voices out there. And I want to be part of that process. I, we've got to affect change in this country. And one of the biggest priorities I've got is getting rid of Sadiq Khan. I am a Londoner <laughs> and Sadiq Khan is bad. He's bad for the United Kingdom. He's bad for London. He's got to go. I, I'm, I'm just a surprise he's still in office. But there we go. I, I did a show <laughs> on Wednesday called Off the Cuff with my son. He's only 12. And uh, it's only a short little broadcast on rich politics that we do. And it's really a 12 year old's perspective on politics. And he brought up knife crime in London. And, uh, you know, well, there you enough, go. so, you know, it just goes to show it's cutting through even with young people. Well, Ben, listen, our time is up. Thank you so much. I hope you can come back on another episode. I've been so excited to have you on uh, today on this Sunday special. Thank you, Richard. All it's our been a pleasure. viewers out there, please don't forget to subscribe. If you want to find out more about Ben Habib and the work of Unlock, visit, the, visit them on social media. They've got a YouTube channel. It's an alternative news uh, outlet. And I'm sure, like me, you will be thrilled by some of the stuff they're putting out. So make sure you check them out. Thanks for tuning in to this week's broadcast, and I'll catch you next week on Rich Politics.